Just a fair warning before I begin here, there are some sections in this video where I talk about suicidal ideation, and it's important enough to this conversation that I can't just make it skippable. So if you think you'd be uncomfortable with that right now, probably a good idea to listen to this later. The world and its functions, when looked at with the intention of being intimately understood, are much accustomed to complexities and spectrums that we tend to avoid in our day-to-day -day descriptors that are biased towards the categorical. While it will become a recurring theme throughout my writings, I want to introduce people to understanding things we see in categorical or black and white terms through a spectrum of possibilities, disabilities being the example this time around. The public's perception of disability in general is still murky. Only in recent few decades have invisible disabilities, usually in regards to mental health, been taken more seriously with the advent of the 988 suicide hotline and studies focusing on deaths of despair. While there's a lack of public understanding in regards to invisible disabilities, another frontier that isn't as widely understood is how we categorize and define disability itself. Disabilities are currently seen through a medical framing because that's how any health issue gains legitimacy in the public eye as a set of criterias, diagnosis, and applicable treatment options. However, the way conditions of disability manifest will not always fall in line with a clean and orderly set of criteria, and limiting a diagnosis through that methodology can leave plenty of blind spots. When I was still in high school, taking a psychology class as a teenager, we had a unit on depression that closely followed a version of the DSM. There were a list of around seven criteria, with two special ones at the end of the list. For a person to be depressed, they needed to fulfill a minimum portion of the seven criteria, or one of the last two, first among them being suicidality, or wishing you were dead. To practice applying these criteria to make a diagnosis, we were given four scenarios, each describing a different person. Some of them described the symptoms of unrelated conditions like PMS to throw us off, but it was the last scenario that helped me understand how vague diagnosing a disability is within the modern medical system. This last scenario described a man named John, who owned a farm through multiple family generations and loved working the land for a living. One day, John gets into an accident with his equipment that permanently disables him. The disability is so severe that it makes farm work impossible, forcing him to sell the farm and work in an office job which was more compatible with his new physical disabilities. John hates this office job, but is aware that because of his finances and disability, he is unlikely to find employment elsewhere. John is suicidal and wants to die. Does John have depression? Now, setting aside that this is one hell of a scenario to present a bunch of teenagers with, every kid in that class raised their hand. John clearly had depression because meeting one of the final two criteria of depression, suicidality, meant you had a mental illness. My hand was the only one that wasn't raised. I found it inappropriate to consider John mentally disabled in the form of depression for having an understandable reaction to extremely traumatizing and life-changing events. While these thoughts are obviously unhealthy and suicide itself is not the answer to John's problems, to say that these feelings stem from a mental condition is just flat-out ignorant of the full context of his situation. It's reductionist. This lack in our ability to correctly label depression has a historical basis. For the longest time, during ages of humanity where the church was the state, suicide was seen as a crime for two reasons. Firstly, it breaks the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill, and secondly, since your soul is observed by the church as God's creation, extinguishing it through suicide could be seen as wrongly enacting your own will over one of his creations. This criminalization of suicide meant that those affected were denied funeral services by the church, since a funeral service is seen as a religious matter, just like marriage or baptism. Thankfully, this didn't remain the case forever, as it's understandably unpopular to treat a person poorly in death who was already so sad in life that they had ended it by their own hand. The argument which changed the tides was that a person could only be suicidal if they were mentally ill. Only a sane person would be able to truly understand how important the divine gift of life was, and would only consider extinguishing it in lapse of such sanity, thus absolving them of responsibility. I mention this history because, while it's true that our medicalization of mental illness suffers from an ignorance towards the societal conditions that cause it, these misunderstandings are also rooted in cultural compromises which do not serve the same utility they did at the time. Despite these shifting tides, this way of thinking is still stuck in the public consciousness. When we describe the act of killing oneself by saying they committed suicide, we're still wording it as if it's an act of criminality, despite that not being the case for hundreds of years. These historical misunderstandings lead to the consequence of flawed diagnostic criteria in the modern age, because we fail to consider that suicidality may perhaps be a reasonable human response to traumatic events. 
Aside from flawed assumptions, the different names we give to various flavors of depression, both medical postpartum depression and colloquial post-con depression, show that there is a lack of proper descriptors for the spectrum of experiences we consider broadly as depression. Since depression can be better understood as a spectrum, it could be argued that it's more than just a diagnosis achieved after meeting a set of criteria, while also being heavily influenced by situational factors, something that's ignored in other disabilities beyond depression. If John the Farmer's predicament was already a bit of a head-scratcher, let's move on to another example of a mental condition that is heavily affected by environment, schizophrenia. In an article called The Happiest Man in the World, which I genuinely recommend reading, it's a good story, Pagan Kennedy details how schizophrenic delusions don't always manifest as something negative, and how this can affect a psychologist's approach to treatment. When most people think of schizophrenic delusions, they think of common ones like those demonstrated in this training video made by actors for the University of Nottingham. They're paranoid in nature, characterized by intrusive assumptions about how your friends are secretly working for the government to spy on you, that your thoughts are being listened to, and that weird messages are being hidden in the books you read. Obviously, these delusions would negatively affect one's ability to function, but these are not the delusions described in The Happiest Man in the World. The first example Kennedy gives is a man named Harry. His delusions make him believe that he was one day secretly recorded picking his nose, and that the video became viral to the point of strangers touching their noses when he passes by, as if to signal, hey, you're the nose-picking guy. To Harry, these people all felt as if they were friends of his, and he describes this delusion of internet stardom as feeling like a safety blanket. The article notes that these delusions are most likely inspired by Harry's obsessive consumption of content on YouTube. While a person's environment and culture can have effects on how schizophrenic delusions manifest, that's a huge topic on its own that I won't have time to cover here. Just as John the Farmer's depression is not the same as what we usually envision when we think of such a condition, Harry's delusions are not what we usually imagine when we think of schizophrenia. In both instances, the situational factors surrounding the subject's mental condition weigh heavily on the approach to treatment. Giving John antidepressants wouldn't help his specific condition, and giving Harry antipsychotics might not either. It's a tricky gamble. Harry even notes himself that if these delusions weren't real, he would, quote, feel alone and crazy. While the article gives examples of other patients, the pattern is the same. These grandiose delusions make them feel as if they're battling a psionic war, or acting as a secret agent to save the country, or telepathically sending people happy thoughts to make them feel better. Just as Maslow details in his hierarchy of needs, people require a sense of belonging, in part by feeling that their contributions to society are meaningful, and these delusions tend to fulfill this need for the schizophrenic individuals described in The Happiest Man in the World. The article tends to support this connection, saying that Harry's high self-esteem is proven by the high marks he received on tests such as the Life Regard Index and the Existential Meaning Scale. By no means am I trying to claim that medical treatment for mental conditions is a bad thing, and if that's something your doctor thinks is best for you, it would be irresponsible and, frankly, dangerous to turn that down. I point to these examples not as an opponent of medicalism, but rather to highlight its blind spots so it can be more well-respected by those it intends to help. In my opinion, the best way to better see these blind spots would be by thinking of disability in general as a spectrum. To represent this spectrum, I'd like you to think of a two-dimensional plane, similar to a political compass, that is made of the sum of two axes, time and detriment. To what length of time will the disability affect the individual, and to what detriment does it cause them? Since different forms of depression, such as postpartum and clinical, occupy different parts of the time axis, we are able to visualize how this disability in particular is a spectrum. This spectrum theory of disability raises many new possibilities and scenarios. For instance, the same disabling condition can occupy radically different parts of the spectrum based on access to care. A fractured bone can be either temporarily or permanently debilitating based on your access to surgery and physical therapy. Through this spectrum analysis of disability, it is made easier for us to consider environment as the important factor it is in these scenarios that we tend to overlook. Besides, it's too elementary to assume that any person suffering from hardship can function as a rational actor and choose to receive treatment, because this implies that we live in a world where treatment isn't barred by things like affordability, availability, and infrastructure. The time domain certainly begs questions about how accessible treatment is to the individual, or what form of a specific disability they have, while the axis of how debilitating the disability is tends to raise questions about accessibility. I have a feeling that if I were to ask people which disability is more debilitating, deafness or blindness, I think most would rate blindness as more extreme on the axis of detriment. Even blindness itself occupies many different areas of the spectrum since legally blind, 2200 vision, and completely blind, no vision whatsoever, are two different things, not to mention temporary forms of blindness such as cataracts, but I digress. 
This admission of blindness as being more debilitating than deafness, while partially an admission of how important each sense is in everyday life, is also an admission of how well we normally accommodate such disabilities. There are more visual cues for the deaf, such as warning areas colored in yellow, electronic signage for crosswalks, and lights on cars to indicate turning and backing up, than there are audio cues for the blind. Most non-commercial cars don't have backup beepers, and not all crosswalks are required to have auditory cues to indicate when it's safe to cross. I'm inclined to believe that modern society implements accessibility features based on how difficult it is to do so, rather than these features being proportional to the commonality or detriment of a disabling condition. Regardless, these features affect how debilitating a disability is, and this gives a hopeful perspective for the disabled because it means the severity of their condition isn't set in stone and may become less burdensome as accessibility features are improved. Getting back to the spectrum, which is a crossroads between how debilitating and how chronic a condition is, this creates a new perspective where instead of a hierarchy of disability, we have a spectrum of disability. And this difference is important because it promotes camaraderie between disabled folks to form support and advocacy groups instead of treating disabling conditions like a hierarchical distribution where the default assumption is that higher severities are always rarer and that lower ones aren't as important. This inevitably hurts cohesion. One example of this outcome is how some of the chronically depressed become offended by those of less chronic depressive conditions trying to empathize. I've even seen some compare empathy from their friends or family members with temporary depression to a person with a paper cut saying they know what it's like to someone whose leg has been chopped off. This is a poor way to conceptualize things. It isn't about whether or not someone had real depression just because it wasn't as chronic as another person's. Rather, this disconnect should make us more conscious of how different manifestations of one condition are spread out across the spectrum of disability. It should encourage us to ponder questions like, what accommodations am I missing that would bring my quality of life up to the point of someone with less chronic depression? Thinking of these deltas in a communal framing instead of a competitive one aids us in realizing that helping other disabled folks' needs will inevitably help us with ours too. They're all pieces to the same puzzle. The way I've come to these understandings about spectrums and camaraderie is a bit of a story, but one that I think is worth mentioning. While I've made it clear in previous videos of mine that I suffer from depression, I also have problems with anxiety and the plethora of things I worry about to an unhealthy extent because of it. One of these things is COVID. A recent anxiety I've had in regards to it is that it's treated as an inevitability. That because of how many waves we've gone through and how hard it is to get people to care after so many years have passed, it just feels inevitable that we're all going to get it. Obviously, I find this attitude unacceptable and a far cry from reality, but also threatening because of the aspects of long COVID we're starting to understand as of recent. Most frightening among them, brain damage. To put it simply, the inflammation one experiences from COVID can affect the brain, causing damage that results in the infamous COVID brain fog people are talking about more recently. It's a factor that may very well be kneecapping the quality of life, along with school and work performance, of many Americans. This already scares me because my life is already hard enough with the symptoms I experience due to depression. Worse than this, however, is that just like the farmer scenario I was discussing earlier, this additional disability would rob me of a meaningful part of my life to the point of suicidal ideation. COVID brain fog would very likely render me unable to write as well as I do now since ideas and thoughts would become harder to form. I'm not sure if I could live a life where I was incapable of writing since it gives me a sense of purpose and emotional fulfillment. It's my favorite way to express myself, and I struggle to imagine a world where I'm living happily without it. Stepping aside from this anxiety for a moment, while also frivolously using masks and hand washing in the meantime, I soon ask the question, how common is brain damage really? Because if we step back and look at different conditions that can be loosely classified as brain damage, it encompasses many things that affect more people than you'd assume. Depression, especially if left untreated for long periods of time, can physically alter the brain. There is still debate about the specifics, but it seems to affect brain size in areas such as the hippocampus, which is associated with memory, and the amygdala, which regulates emotion and memory. Of course, there are other ways in which the brain physically changes with chronic depression that I don't mention here for the sake of brevity, but if you're interested in learning more, I'll link the Healthline article I used to make sure that the stats I remember on this from five years ago are still accurate today. Anyways, if your definition of brain damage is a physical change in the brain that potentially hurts one's ability to function, this would certainly fit the bill. Something else that might fulfill those conditions would be microplastics. I'm sure some of you who skim headlines or watch internet people explain this phenomena already know that microplastics are so omnipresent that it's hard for researchers to find subjects who aren't already contaminated with it to some extent. More troubling, however, is what these substances are up to when inside the body. While this is just one study and the testing had only been done on mice, assistant professor Jamie Ross and her lab published a study pertaining to this topic. Not only does it affirm the now common claim that microplastics are capable of crossing the blood-brain barrier, but 
but the study also found that after crossing this barrier, they deposit themselves deep into brain tissue. This would explain the resulting cognitive decline observed in the rats that were exposed to what Ross believed was, quote, not a high dose of microplastics compared to the control group. If these findings are as applicable to humans as the rats in this study, then, like depression, this would be another example of a common condition that causes brain damage. I'm sure that by pointing out how microplastics are potentially causing brain damage, my American viewers are wondering when I'll mention the neurological effects of lead poisoning. Unfortunately, America is one of the worst countries in the Western world in regards to banning lead in paint and other commercial products. As former White House senior policy advisor Emily Benfer notes, quote, The League of Nations banned lead in paint in 1922. The U.S. didn't sign on and one year later added lead to gasoline. Industry seems to trump health. One study a lot of articles love pointing to, titled Half of U.S. Population Exposed to Adverse Lead Levels in Early Childhood, claims, based on a nationally representative dataset, that a blood lead level, BLL, of greater than 5 micrograms per deciliter was observed in more than 90% of those born between 1951 and 1980. For perspective, a BLL of 3.5 micrograms per deciliter or greater in children is considered elevated, while that amount is 5 micrograms for adults. Thankfully, the study notes that, quote, BLLs were considerably lower than 5 micrograms per deciliter among those born since 2001. As a zoomer, that's a huge relief. Anyways, I mention how widespread this exposure is because newer understandings of BLLs on cognitive function now find that any amount can contribute to neurological problems. Put simply, there is no safe level of lead in human blood. While most will point to loss of IQ points as evidence of this cognitive decline, I think a better way of demonstrating this is the lead crime hypothesis, especially considering IQ tests can be unreliable. The lead crime hypothesis states that reduced national lead exposure due to the phasing out of leaded gasoline in 1986 was in part responsible for the sharp fall in crime rates during the 1990s. As a reminder, the study I mentioned earlier stated that over 90% of people born between 1951 and 1980 had elevated BLLs. Now we know why the end of that range was 1980. Moving on, this lead crime hypothesis goes on to claim that the reason for this correlation is most likely due to how lead's cognitive effects manifest in an increase of impulsive actions and social aggression. For those curious, there was a meta-analysis done in the past few years that examined a couple dozen studies on this hypothesis and concluded that there was evidence of a partial correlation between lead and crime. While this effect might not be as extreme as other factors such as poverty, lack of abortion access, and poor nutrition, it still has an effect nonetheless. But let's say that, against all odds, you've never had chronic depression, never been infected with COVID, were born after 2001, and don't have enough microplastics in your system to cause cognitive decline. There is still one final factor that may just affect you. Your job. I'm sure that, for many out there, the feeling of brain fog and cognitive inability after a week of working overtime is not new. That said, I'm glad Adam Conover's episode of Adam Ruins Everything, called Adam Ruins Work, Adam, 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 briefly mentions that there is a shred of evidence to back up this feeling many Americans already have. In the segment mentioning this, he says, quote, Longer hours result in lower scores on cognitive performance tests. In other words, you are literally working your employees stupid. His listed source for this claim, titled Long Working Hours and Cognitive Function, the Whitehall 2 study, narrows down Adam's broad claim by stating that working more than 55 hours a week, compared to the 40-hour baseline, caused study participants to score lower on tests for reasoning and vocabulary. Once again, I'm very thankful to see another study that isn't using IQ as a measurement scale for cognitive changes. 55 hours might sound like a lot to some of you, but according to Gallup polls from 2014, which unfortunately was the most recent year I could find, 18% of full-time U.S. workers reported working more than 60 hours in a typical week, with 21% saying that it was 50 to 59 hours. Based on this, you could argue that somewhere in the range of 18 to 39% of adult full-time workers in the United States are regularly experiencing some kind of cognitive decline, or for the sake of this video, temporary brain damage, from their average work week. To summarize this section, chronic depression, microplastics exposure, lead exposure, long COVID, and overworking yourself can all lead to this umbrella definition of brain damage. While I'm sure some professionals would have a problem with me referring to cases where it's caused purely by mental illness or in cases where it's most likely temporary, such as with overwork, there's a larger point to be made from this thought experiment. I focused on this section for so long because my deep anxieties in regards to COVID brain fog robbing me of a dignified life are not entirely due to America's terrible COVID response, but also how we fail to look at disabilities as a spectrum. Brain damage is the best example I can think of as a disability that would benefit from being seen as part of a spectrum. Brain damage would be less scary if we acknowledge it as being the result of a plethora of factors that potentially affect the majority of Americans. Brain damage would be less debilitating if we weren't afraid to call it as such when cognitive damage arises from long COVID, overworking, and chronic 
depression. Brain damage would be less frightening if we correctly stop assuming that all forms of it are permanent. If we cared more about treating temporary brain damage from overworking, maybe we could take brain damage caused by other sources more seriously, and be more prepared to actually help those, whatever part of the spectrum of it they're on, to be able to see better options than suicide when it affects their lives. Maybe then we could live in a world that would help the disabled farmer be a happy person, or the potentially stunted writer still live a meaningful life. This theory of disability as a spectrum plays into one of my strongest held beliefs, that no life should ever be considered completely ruined. Not by criminality, not by substance abuse, not by happenstance of birth, and certainly not by disability. A societal structure has failed its citizenry when they believe that the threat of personal instability is so close that it can be caused at the hands of a single event or a disadvantage such as a disability. I hope to one day live in a world where having a disability doesn't mean that your life is over.